seconds and counting. Hey, what's good, yo? Welcome back to another video. It's Nisha. I'm joined with Drew, E, and Roman. And today we're going to be having our podcast about the Texans draft. Um, it is coming in four more days. Super, super excited. And we're going to cover a lot of things like Nick Casario's press conference recently. I believe it was on the 21st. Um, his uh, Nick's draft philosophy. We might talk about some of the prospects that we might consider at the top of the draft. So, uh, what our draft needs are, some sleepers, and hopefully hopefully we might end it with a three-round mock draft. But let's just start with Nick Casero's press conference. I think this was a pretty insightful one. Um, most of the time, Nick Casero just has like a word salad, just kind of dumps around the, the point usually. But I think he actually said some decent things as to what he's looking for. Um, some of the things that I wrote down are like team first, selfless leaders. Um, I think he values character as equally important as a player's talent i think like some teams cultures like the raiders or the cowboys they're like more lenient on like the hero issues and are more um willing to accept uh, a player like that so but i think nick Acero, he really wants like guys who are willing to learn humble hardworking, smart guys of that nature so what do you guys think about um like nick Casero's criteria yeah, I mean, it really all connects to everything we've heard about Nick Casario. We know that he just, he values everything. He takes everything into consideration. He's going to want someone who's committed to winning. Um, I know we've had some concerns and, you know, certain players in the draft. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But just for example, like Kayvon Thibodeau and his question marks, that may factor into the Texans, you know, not picking Kayvon Thibodeau. Nick Casario wants someone who's going to work hard, um, like you said, team first, who's a leader, who's able to, you know, behave the way that he's supposed to, and just kind of, you know, talent is important to him, but he's going to take every factor into consideration so that that player that he may pick is the best player for the Texans program. Uh, yeah, it makes a ton of sense what Nick Casario is trying to do. It dates back all the way to his New England days when he was there. You don't really see New England bringing these guys, I guess, have kind of character concerns. They don't really draft many guys have character concerns or whatnot. And we've kind of seen that here in Houston over the last year or so with Nick Casario as the general manager. Um, we've seen it last year in the draft as well with his third-round picks, where his two third-round picks. But Davis Mills, he comes from Stanford. That's like a stand-up guy. That's a stand-up college. You don't hear anything but... I guess, positivity from Davis Mills or, like, people around him. Um, same thing with Nico Collins. Seems like a very good stand-up guy. But the key thing is they're also good football players. It's not the, – the, a lot of fans get it misinterpreted. They think, oh, we're just bringing in good people, not good football players. But Nick Casario's thing is he wants to bring in, I guess, people that are both, like good football players and good people. And we've seen that with the whole draft class last year. Um, a few free agents this year, like, of course, Steven Nelson, Marlon Mack. Um, a few of the other guys, he brought back Desmond King, good piece in the locker room, good locker room guy, keep the chemistry together. So it makes sense in a football team perspective and a PR perspective, all of that. You want good people in the locker room. You want good people on the field, smart people on the field. So it makes a ton of sense. I really, I really amend Nick Serio for, I guess, saying that and like showing it as well. Yeah, and you got to factor in the fact that the players are going to be working under Robbie Smith and Pep Hamilton, and like those two guys are not going to be guys you want to mess with or cause troubles around because they're like pretty straight to the point type of guys. You, you come in, you do your job in practice, you want to learn, you want to win, and like you got to factor it in too. It's not just about like the personality of the player, it's also about the coaching staff they'll be working under. So, like, let's say we draft Kayvon Thibodeau and he starts giving up, giving up on plays, starts causing some maybe locker room issues, no idea. You're just going to be, that's probably going to be a very big L of a draft pick because Lovey Smith and Pep Hamilton, two, two guys in the locker room that just run it like straight to the point. Don't mess around, come in, do your job, go home. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think um, that kind of goes in with like Nick Casario. Um, when, when, I just think that, yeah, I think when you're building a culture, you want to bring in guys to really match that. And then you can start bringing talent. 
and you can mold that talent to fit the culture later on. So you right now in these first two years of rebuilding, you want to first establish your culture. And I think the Texans have generally had like kind of drafting good guys that have been um, clear of like legal issues for the most part. Um, I think there's like a stat like since like 20, 2000 that like the Texans had like the least number of players that were um, arrested or things like that. I know we were established in 2002, but like that was, that's what the stat was. But even then, like we still had a very, very low number of players like have, that have been in trouble. So I think since the beginning, I think Nick Casero is like trying to continue that tradition of drafting good guys. And uh, so, yeah, I think there's nothing wrong with that, but it did catch a lot of controversy on tr Twitter, like Roman alluded to. But yeah, and then another point, he did talk extensively about Austin Eckler. So I just want to know, like, what, what are you guys' thoughts on, like, does that change, like, your idea of what kind of running back Nick Casero is looking for? Um, Not exactly, because, I mean... I think it, he's talking about just Austin Eckler, like as a, in general, you know, he can do it all, um, you know, passing game, he's really a good catcher, and a lot of fan players love him. Great blocker, great runner, undrafted guy too. Big thing there is that it just shows you how much Nick Sarah values the and everyone that's entering in the draft. He values the late round picks. He values the undrafted players. So he's going to use this uh, ginormous undrafted free agency pool that we're coming up on. Because this draft is like three times bigger than last year's draft, I mean, there's going to be so many more undrafted free agents, and, and he will he will still draft a running back, you know, somewhere in the draft. But he'll also pick up a couple, you know, a couple running backs in the undrafted free agency too. But running back is definitely a position that we need to address, and definitely something that Casario is probably looking to address. So uh, yeah, first I kind of thought that I meant maybe more so is going to try to get a running back early that kind of like matches Eckler's, I guess, place, not play style or whatnot, but like the type of player and person he is. Because when you go back to Austin Eckler, not only is a good football player, but he's a good person as well. And that goes back to the example of wanting to create a good, I guess, locker room, a good chemistry all around. So going back to that, so it's not only a good football player, but as well as well, a good person. And he's brought up Austin Eckler like a good three, four times maybe this whole offseason. He brought him back in January, I think. And then again, this most recent press conference, but yeah, as Drew was saying, I think it's not going to really change much. I guess in the, in the running back thing, we're still, of course, going to draft one. Will we draft one early? I mean, we've brought in some of the top, or I guess the early guys in. We brought um, Brees Hall in for a visit. We brought Isaiah Spiller in for a visit. I'm not sure if we brought in uh, Kenneth Walker, but I know we have brought in those two, and those are two guys that are kind of go early. So I don't know if Nick is kind of at least gauging the possibility of going running back, maybe at 37 or a 60 or something, or 68, I mean. But it's going to be definitely interesting to see over the next week, obviously. Yeah, I definitely agree with that take. It's probably like he's alluding to someone of Austin Eckler's play style more than, you know, like Austin Eckler's personality itself. Or if he went undrafted, it's maybe like someone like Kenneth Walker, although he didn't have a visit with us. But I'm pretty sure he's the same height as Eckler and same weight and has a similar play style. I wouldn't say they're like the same exact player. So maybe that's something we should keep an eye out on if the Texans do end up going Kenneth Walker. And then another point that Nick Casero talked about is that they probably end up drafting at three. They're, he doesn't envision many teams moving up to three, and you can probably attribute that to a weaker quarterback draft class. So let's just talk about the draft philosophy, I guess, particularly at three. We haven't really talked about Trayvon Walker at all. Um, because I, there have been some people, some analysts, I guess, um, mocking Trayvon Walker to the Texans saying like, oh, he does need time to learn like pass rush moves and the Texans are rebuilding. So it just makes sense for them to draft Trayvon Walker. He has like a, like solid upside. Um, he has, he's very, um, physically gifted. So that's why I, that's why a lot of people are mocking him to the Texans. But what are you guys' thoughts, like, initially on Trayvon Walker? Do you think he's worth to be drafted in the top three? Yeah, I mean, I understand what those analysts are saying about Trayvon Walker. And, uh, you know, the Texans, they do have time. But I think it's kind of the other way around. I think right now the Texans need, you know, a star. They need a face of the franchise. They need a sure thing. So Trayvon Walker, while he does have 
the elite combination of strength and speed on the relative athletic score. He has the that perfect 10, which is like he's one of the most athletic defensive ends slash edge prospects that we've ever seen. Uh, he's going to have positional versatility. He's going to be able to play the three tech, the four eye, the five tech. Um, he can, you know, put him on stunts. He's a great run defender, but he's just not a good pass rusher. Uh, I think his win, his pass rush win rate is anywhere between six uh, percent in one spot, nine percent one spot, which is just like bottom ten of the the, the you know pass rushers, the good pass rushers entering this draft. It's just not there. And, I understand the development, you know, he has a chance to develop, but I just don't think that's what the Texans need to be doing right now. They need to be focusing their efforts on a player that's already better and is still young. And for example, Cameron Thibodeau is better. He's young. He's more potential or about the same amount of potential as Trayvon Walker. Oh uh, yeah. Trayvon Walker is a talent oozing with potential. He has all the talent in the world. Of course, we saw him put on his athletic display at the combine. But as Drew was saying, and as Anish was saying, going back, I guess, um, somewhat through the season, he's not the best of players. More so of it is, like, his, I guess, athleticism. His tape is there, but it isn't, I guess, worthy of a top three pick. Um, Personally, I wouldn't draft him at uh, number three. I don't think I would even draft him at, at 13. I think I definitely would. Like, you really can't pass up a player with, I guess, that much potential at 13. But at three, it's a different story. I don't think I would really touch him. Um, as Drew was saying, Kayvon Thibodeau, he's, I think, around the same age or so. And he has the same, if not more, potential than him. Sure, the, going back to the character, things, the good people thingy. But um, Trayvon Walker probably edges out Kayvon on that part. But as just a pure football player, I don't think you should draft Trayvon Walker at three. If you are to go the end, you either hope number one and number two go super wild and Aiden falls to us at three, which is very, very <laughs> unlikely. Or if you are to go DN, I think you definitely have to go Kayvon Thibodeau over Trayvon Walker. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, like, usually as the draft day comes closer, I tend to read more on prospects I haven't read on. And I tend to fall in love with them the more I read about them. But the only person who hasn't done that for me has got to be Trevon Walker. Just because, like, as everyone just said, he's, he has a lot of potential, but you got to go with it. With Kayvon Thibodeau, he has a similar potential. The only thing you can look look at is, like, the character issues that might be a disadvantage for Nick. But, like, Trayvon Walker is just pretty much a clowny. It's another clowny. I know the comp has been thrown around way too many times. So, like, I don't know if you just go with another clowny type player again, even though, like, the first time didn't really work out, if that makes sense. Yeah, and that clowny comp has been given to Thibodeau for some reason, but it actually does make sense, like you said, to Trayvon Walker. But yeah, again, there's like another thing. Like there's some people saying, oh, he wasn't used properly at Georgia. There's a lot of talent there. So he kind of took the backseat, took a more selfless role, which I guess is what Nick Casario is looking for. But um, but then again, when you when there is so much talent, you almost question like the opposite. Like why was he still not able to get that much production? even though there was a lot of talent. Like, usually when you have so much talent, the other guys um, should all, like, thrive. Um, but for some reason, Trayvon Walker didn't really show that production-wise. So I think it will be pretty interesting. I think it's safe to say that he's probably the least favorite, um, like, player available, that potentially available at three. Like, if you have Evan Neal or Kemba Kwanu, like, at least they have, like, really distinguished um, collegiate careers. Like, they've actually succeeded in college whereas Trayvon Walker like he's he's like lacking in production basically so like he does have the upside but it's at when you're at the top you probably want to lean a little bit more on the production and then later on you want to lean more towards the athletic traits and things like that and take more risks um I think that someone mentioned like Daniel Hunter he was drafted like in the third round similar to Walker he didn't have like a lot of production but he ended up being really good. But then again, he was drafted in the third round, not pick three. So um, that's that goes to show you something. But yeah, those are our thoughts on Trayvon Walker. Let us know what you think about that. But let's move on to Stingley and Sauce discussion. I know um, we 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 uploaded a video about Stingley versus Sauce, but it's a bit it's like a it's a pretty big debate, honestly. I've seen Texans Twitter very divided um, about this topic. Um, there's a lot of good arguments for both. 
Um, I would just get my thoughts out here quickly, just like I just have one point. Is that for Sauce, for me, like, since Stingley has had his fair share of injuries, that's why I would have Sauce a bit more higher than Stingley, but I just want to hear what you guys have to say. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of an interesting situation because, I mean, right now, if we're just being real, like, the more sure thing is probably Sauce Gardner. He's, he's athletic. He's got the length. Um, he's got the swagger. Um, but I still think that Stingley, by far, I don't really think it's close. I think he has the better potential. Um, insane athlete, insanely good technique, really, really smart player. Um, he was like the number one overall player and in his high school, you know, recruiting class, five star, everything. He had an insane freshman season where he was probably the best defensive player in the country. Uh, C.D. Lamb has gone on record saying that's probably the best quarterback uh, he's ever faced and will face in, uh, while he was in college at Oklahoma. Um, Stingley was going to play wide receiver at one point. His junior year, if he didn't opt out, that's what the kind of the deal they made when he signed with LSU. Of course, he opted out, so he didn't get to do that. So he, he's got the same ball skills, too. That's why he was going to play wide receiver at one point. So I can understand the Texans, you know, taking Sauce. But I can also understand the Texans taking Stingley because um, similar to Trayvon Walker's situation, you're, you're betting on the talent, you're betting on the potential. And I think you know, even Stingley is more refined than a guy like Trayvon Walker. It's where I can't even be upset at that pick because you're talking about a potentially future top five quarterback for the next 10 years. And that's why I, I like Stingley as a player. But right now, I will still say that Sauce is better. And he's the better prospect. Stingley just has so, has so much more potential that is not, that's untapped. Uh, yeah, if we're taking DB at number three, which seems more and more likely by the day, so we lead up to the draft. Then I think I would definitely go Derek Stingley. Um, Derek Stingley just has the most potential out of the two. Nothing taken away from Sauce Gardner. Sauce Gardner, he's a uh, phenomenal cornerback. His stats are legendary. He hasn't allowed a touchdown throughout his whole career in college, and I think he has allowed like one of the lowest pass ratings or something like that. Those stats already are legendary. So um, going back to Derek Stingley. Derek Stingley, I feel like he has the most potential all around. Um he could be better man and zone. He, in my opinion, he's more technically sound. I know a lot of people don't think so. Think of, but when you watch Sauce Gardner, or, yeah, Sauce Gardner, a couple of times he'll get flat-footed or keep his feet on the ground too long before it starts chopping him. And in the NFL, in college it may work, but once he gets to the NFL against these better receivers, these better route runners, such as maybe like a guy like Keenan Allen or maybe like a, a Justin Jefferson, they're going to absolutely expose that. But if you leave your feet too flat on the ground, for too long, if you don't keep it moving, you're going to get exposed. Like, he's just going to run right past you, or he's going to destroy you on the route, and you're not going to be able to catch up. But luckily for Sauce Gardner, he has 4 4 one speed at 6-3 to catch up to that receiver. But I feel like Derek Stingley, he just has better technique all around. And in 2018, uh, it was official that Derek Stingley ran a 4-3-0, and that's insane. As a 6-1 cornerback, I think it was 18 in 2018, somewhere around there, 17, 18 maybe. And to run a 4-3 at that size, I feel like that's something very, very special. Um, but yeah, if we go cornerback at 3, I definitely prefer Stingley. I feel like he's more more gifted, more talented, and has the all-around more potential. And as Drew was saying a little bit earlier, if we're going to go um, thing, uh, cornerback at 3, I think you have to go with the guy who has more potential, and which is Stingley. Yeah, I mean, just before I continue on this, I just just want to say, can like for because when the draft happens, if we take Sauce or Stingley at three, the Jets are definitely probably like taking the other guy. So if we take Sauce, they're taking Stingley. So can we just not turn this into a Jalen Green Evan Mobley situation? <laughs> where like we can we just not do that from now? I'm just saying it because I can't go through that again. <laughs> but personally, I'm higher on Sauce than I am on Stingley. Just because of, you know, this, the injury concerns, that's like a big thing for me because I don't want to go through more injury concerns and more injured players who don't live up to their potential. So it's just maybe like some major PTSD from a lot of our picks recently. So that's maybe why I'm underrating Stingley a little bit. But I think if you look at it as well, Sauce has not had a touchdown thrown at him yet his whole college season, I'm pretty sure. His whole mm -hmm. college career, sorry. So he's definitely a great lockdown defender too. And, you know, when you watch him or you watch his film, 
he tackles like a linebacker. He doesn't tackle like a corner in my eyes. He tackles like a big linebacker is just ready to bring down the play. Yeah, I think when you look at their techniques, I think uh, Stingley uh, uses this mirror technique where they take like six small steps back and then they try to shadow the player, whereas Sauce has more of like a slide step um, where he tries to like just like attack, like really engage with the wide receiver that first five yards, whereas Stingley tries to like see them out and try to um, like just like see, like he's not as super at aggressive at like the line of scrimmage like sauce would be and sauce is seen to be more like grabby and stuff but i think like you said um when you we said it earlier like with trayvon walker like you want to get the more surefire guy and for me that would be sauce gardner um with stingley i feel like um it would take a little bit longer for him to like for his technique to at least translate uh, whereas sauce is i think it will make a day one impact right away so it just, I mean, you can, I mean, there is really not much of a need to, like, rush, like, a player's development or be impatient. But, like, if you're going through that same mindset, um, like, we want a surefire thing, I think Sauce would be that guy. So, that that's my thoughts on that. And so, and now let's move on to the next topic. What are the order for draft needs? Because I know some sites have a weird, like, I know PFF, they want to say like, oh, every we have every position is a need for us. So, um, but yeah, that's pretty funny. But I think, um, I think at the last of our needs would be tackle since we believe in Tyrese Howard and um, Larry Tunsil. And quarterback, I feel like maybe like a late round pick, like undrafted or late round pick just to give Mills competition. But other than that, I feel like those needs are kind of towards the end of the list. But where do you guys think? What positions do you guys think are near the top of the list? Oh, uh, yeah. Technically, I guess PFF isn't totally wrong. I mean, as you said, we don't really need quarterback at Mills, at least for this year. And, of course, we don't need offensive tackles. But if we're going to take those two away, um, let's see. I feel like interior offensive line is very, very huge for us. We don't really have any, I guess, surefire guards for the future. Um, we have who? AJ Cannon right now. Left guard, I don't even really know. Starting maybe. Um, yeah, I would definitely have to be guard. And, of course, another pass rusher. We need to get another pass rusher in there with Jonathan Bernard. Um, Jacob Martin left in free agency, I believe. I think so. Um, mm -hmm. And our pass rusher, other than Bernard, isn't really nothing to be excited for. Nothing that offensive should really fear or game plan against. So probably first, into your offensive line. Second, maybe just D-line in general. Um, I feel like you get any impactful defensive line player impacted from any way, whether it's interior or, or the edge presence. And then maybe third, let's see, probably I want to say kind of running back, but then again, running back isn't like a, I guess like a premium anymore. Like you can find running backs almost anywhere as long as you have a good offensive line. But I feel like you definitely do need some juice at running back. It's either running back or secondary. Like, you can definitely get back better in the secondary position. And a secondary, I think, safeties, um, it's MJ Stewart and Eric Murray starting as of right now, and that's really not a good tandem. Um, I don't think any, neither of them should really be starting on an NFL team. They're both backups, both rotational pieces. So I feel like safety you could definitely improve on. Cornerback you can definitely – basically, P.F. Puff is right. We need every position. <laughs> but those are my top three um, positions. Yeah, I, I pretty much was going to say the same thing. Like, we need every position almost, other than QB and tackle, pretty much. But the most important need, in my opinion, is not really a position. It's more of like a star player, like a Jalen Green type player. Just you can make him the face of the franchise. You can market him to everyone in the NFL, and he has insane potential, insane talent. So. As long as we get someone of that caliber of like talent, potential, market mobility, just all around like a Jalen Green type, I feel like we'll be in good hands no matter what position he is. Yeah, that's very fair. And yeah, I think overall I would say yeah, inside of the line, like you said, safety slash cornerback, then D line, uh D N maybe. I feel like like we try to we have like solid players that um Inside D-line, like Roy Lopez, Malik Collins. Whereas D-end, we're, like, banking on um, Ogbo, Karankwo. And then safety is just, like... And we have MJ Stewart. Um, but, 
I don't know if he'll, but like I don't know if he's gonna like work out for us per se. So I think like yeah, DB is second for me, and then um, D end, um, and then after that would be running back, wide receiver, um, linebacker, and then quarter quarterback, left tackle or tackle. So I think that's the order I would have it. Um, obviously there might be a few discrepancies there, but definitely agree with you that we need a star player for sure. And hopefully we find one at pick three and thirteen, and uh, maybe even in the later of the draft. But yeah. So finally, uh, so finally, our last topic is what sleepers do you guys have in the draft? Some guys that are not getting enough hype, um, or guys you would really want to see on the Texans maybe in the later rounds. Uh, yeah, I don't. I haven't really studied, I guess, too much into the later round guys. Maybe a couple off my top of the bat. It's definitely Tolbert wide receiver i think he's like six one, six two, and he's absolutely ripped as a player like he's he has muscle he has a like he has a good body i mean oh uh, yeah he has he's muscular he's very muscular he's very fast and he has like a four four three one or something like that um he's a very i guess all-around wide receiver he's more of a deep threat but he can do it all he's, vis- he's very physical um but that would be maybe one of my guys maybe like an alec uh what's his name alec they're running Pierce. back from yeah, Alec Pierce. Um, maybe a guy like that. Um, let's see. Who's the safety from Vron McKinley? I think oh, he's from okay. Oregon. Um, I feel like he would be a very – maybe like a fifth-round, sixth-round type of guy. Um, maybe his son Haskins. I know he had a virtual meeting with him um, or at least a visit or something like that. He could probably be a guy, like a running back, like maybe in the sixth round, potentially fifth-round, sixth round. Um, and he comes from Michigan where, I guess – uh, we have kind of a similar connection. But, um, yeah, I guess there's a couple guys here. Yeah, my my sleeper pick, because like, I haven't done much research into that just yet, but I don't know even if you can call him a sleeper pick. It's the return specialist or cornerback from Houston, Marcus Jones. I feel like he's being slept on heavily because if you look at it, PFF released today the highest rated cornerbacks in single coverage during the PFF era, and he was the third highest graded cornerback uh, in single coverage, just behind Sauce Gardner and Paulson Adibo, and just in front of Derek Stingley, like the same player we were talking about just like 10 minutes ago. So he's definitely, definitely a sleeper. He could like maybe be a starter on this team. He can definitely be a starting return specialist. He could definitely make an impact on day one. Like I wouldn't be surprised if we dropped him late in the fourth and he returns a punt for a touchdown in the court, you know, or something like that. He's very, very talented. And I guess for me, uh, I have I did like a mock draft earlier today just for fun. And I really like starting to like Brian Robinson Jr. Um, r- running back from Alabama. If you look at the track record of previous Alabama running backs, you see Derrick Henry, Najee Harris, Damian Harris, um, um, Josh Jacobs. And so, I feel like with that, you have a pretty high success rate with Alabama running backs, regardless of like the other O line and things like that. And Brian Robinson, he's like he will be a good downhill runner for us. He has a very strong frame. Um, I think he he also had um, he as far as uh, career rush yards after contact, he has he's had like a thousand eight hundred forty one yards. So that's pretty incredible um like uh like i guess over his career so i think that's pretty good um for someone to make plays out of nothing um i think the texans really thrived on um when they brought in carlos Hyde that one year he did really really well so hopefully he might be a similar role like he's not gonna like be like a super super elusive guy but i think in terms of just like getting you yardage he's he's the guy you want and like pep Pep, as far as running the ball, is probably on a ground and pound. Just like, just turn those yards. Try to really establish a run game. See what happens from there. Um. So yeah, and I think we're gonna end the. Uh, sorry, what was that? I uh, just I want to go back really quickly to the Alabama point where you just said mm-hmm. you can't go wrong with an Alabama running back. You also can't go wrong with an Alabama receiver. So mm-hmm. just some Jamison Williams prop <laughs> right now in the middle of the podcast. <laughs> You know, number yeah. 13, probably oh, see yeah. Jameson Williams down there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, Jameson Williams, as uh, Biggie was saying, 
can never get enough to Mr. Williams, I guess. So at 13, I would run up the pick to lose there. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I think the one thing I'm worried about as far as like Jameson Williams, if like say the Packers really want him to replace the Devontae Adams Lloyd, do y'all think like what would it take for you to like give up on Jameson? In a way, like for me, I would like really just like keep the pick, just drop Jameson. But like the Packers, like what would be like sufficient draft capital in return for you to move down to their pick? Uh, for me, it would kind of take a lot. What a pick! I think they have twenty two and twenty eight or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um. Let's see. It would definitely have to be twenty two, and I'm not sure if I would want twenty eight. I think I would go for the twenty twenty three first. Um. I feel like that pick has a possibility to be higher. Um, that Packers team kind of got a little bit depleted. It's probably going to take a hit. Of course, the loss of um, Devontae Adams. I think they lost a couple pieces on defense. So I definitely aim for 22 and a 2023 first. But even then, I'm not sure if I would. I feel like Nick Casario would because he values picks a lot. But would I? I personally, I don't think I would. I would just, as, as Anders was saying, I think I would just draft him to Williams. Yeah, I mean, I've been a big preacher of the trading down and getting Traylon Burks as well, mm. that propaganda. But <laughs> I don't know if I can trade down a chance at Jamison Williams for Traylon Burks. As much as I like him, I just feel like they probably have to give up a lot more than they want to. And we're probably going to ask for a lot more than they want to give up anyway. So I don't see like a trade actually happening there. Yeah, let's see if we can try to do a trade. We're going to do a mock draft right now. But since this is a podcast, we'll just try to tell you all what's happening. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so at pick three, I believe we're just going to stay in put. But at pick 13, we'll see what kind of trade calls we'll start to get. I know the phone will be ringing. So let's go ahead and start the draft. So Hutch and Thibodeau go one and two. I think this is like the most likely scenario. Um, Kayvon's upside is just too much to pass up over uh like in, like compared to walker so um so yeah that's why what, what it ends up happening so here i'm inclined to say sauce garner but we just did have that debate between stingley and garner so you could go either way honestly but um uh, what do you guys say at pick three uh yeah i feel like sauce is probably the safer pick but just for the monk draft sake probably sauce but i think personally i would rather take stingley. I mean, yeah, we can just go with sauce for this, but if it's still like a fun mock draft where we're trying to trade down, why not just take Kyle Hamilton? <laughs> Ooh, okay, so you say trade down to where then? Uh, yeah, I mean, if we're trying to trade down pick 13, we oh. we'll just go like Kyle, Kyle Hamilton at three. Oh, okay, okay, got it. Yeah, see, like, I think that's also, like, because Nick Casero doesn't care what people think, I feel. So, like, if they do like Kyle Hamilton a lot, then they might just go with him. So, like, I think that's kind of, like, rare to see now because they everyone sees Kyle Hamilton falling. Uh, it's just hard, like, uh, because I would say safety is our second biggest need, like, or I guess DB. Um, but, man, so should we do a fun one? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like we've always been going sauce lately, so we could switch it up if we want. I don't know. Um, in reality, I feel like there's a very strong chance Kyle Hamilton could fall to 13. But in this case, I mean, since we're trading back, yeah, probably do a big ease. Why not have fun with it? Take Kyle Hamilton and see what happens. All right, yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So maybe this is unrealistic, but let's see what happens. So yeah, Sauce goes four. All right, so we do get. Um, so this time we're going to actually read these trade offers. Um, I've been denying them all the time, but now I'm going to actually look at them. So the Saints are trying to lowball us here, They're trying to give us to move up. I guess, I don't know if it's a lowball per se, but like to move up three spots, they're giving us a fifth rounder this year. The, the Steelers are giving a first, a third, and a fourth to move up seven spots. And then the Patriots are giving us a first, third, and six. So, um, I don't know. Out of these three offers, what which one do you guys think is the most a appealing? Uh, personally, none of these move me at all. Um, they're all pretty, I guess, bad. Or not? Yeah, I would say bad. Personally, I wouldn't do any of these. But if I had to choose one, 
Um, probably that Steelers one. I mean, you're moving back seven spots. You're getting back a third round pick and a fourth round pick. We know Nick Casario values his mid round picks a lot. Would Nick Casario do it? I think he would try to aim more for maybe like a a first, a second, and a fourth, and take out that third. Mm. But um, if I would, I don't think that's anything. Yeah, we have the know. chance to counter offer. So let's see if we do twenty and fifty two. Uh, honestly, if it was just twenty fifty two and maybe like a sixth, I honestly I could I don't know six is kind of too low. Yeah, but... yeah I I kind of like that actually like the first round and their second round and then like the six maybe try to get their fourth. Let's see. That, that works. When like I add their fourth, six. it says unlikely. Let's see. Let's let's try to send in the offer. Uh. Oh, they accepted it. Okay, so let's see. They probably draft Malik Willis in that case, but for some reason they chose Daxton Hill. <laughs> I don't know why he would trade up for Daxton Hill, but all right. And so we oh, well, could have had Jameson. Yeah, had that would have been crazy. So in this mock, y'all y'all can't see, but Jameson went 19 to the Saints. Um, so that's pretty crazy. Um, so here I'm kind of inclined to go possibly inside O line. I would have liked to have Zion Johnson. He went 18 to the Eagles. Since I view inside the line as one of our more pressing needs, I could like Kenyon Green here, but Olave is also here. Um, you also have Devontae Wyatt. Wyatt. Traylon Burks is also here. So what do you guys think at pick 20 then? I feel like Carl Loftus could potentially be an underrated option right here. <laughs> um, I know a lot of fans, a lot of fans don't like him, but um, he's not really a bad player at all. I guess I'm not really sure why he's really fallen as much as he did. I think at one time wasn't he projected like a top ten pick or something like that, and now he's like all the way. Like you see him all the all around in the first round. Some you can see in some mocks he falls to the second round, but mm-hmm. um, at twenty, I feel like. Getting a player like that, I think he's still 21. He's still very young. I yeah. feel like a lot of people think he's old for some reason, like maybe 23-ish. Yeah. Like 21, still full of potential. At 20, getting a, another edge next to uh, Jonathan Bernard. But I feel like another thing is they're kind of both um, – they're both kind of similar, I guess, physiques in a way. They're both power rushers. They're both, I guess, similar, similar sizes. So it's really the best thing. Like you want to at least have one speed rusher. But, um, yeah, right here maybe – I have to agree with you. Maybe interior offensive line, that's a huge need for us. And if we want to give Davis Mills a fair chance and then also improve this running game, offensive line, interior offensive line is definitely a, a huge need. And we could definitely fill that void here with either Zion or, of course, um, Kenyon Green. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Kenyon Green pick here. Not going to lie to you guys, just of the fact that we could probably get a very good starting O lineman inside O's line and add that to give. Drew, Mil- Drew Davis Mills more help and yeah uh, we could probably draft that receiver in the second round that Roman likes I forgot his name Pickens Pickens the six foot four guy that you've been preaching about so <laughs> that way we could just give Davis Mills a lot of help early on and we did get another second right from that Steelers trade so we could always go there uh wide receiver there too so um, but yeah, as far as like um, Carl Loftus, I think, you know, when we m- go back to that quote that Nick Casero said, like, characters as important as talent, I think Carl Loftus, like, really fits that kind of criteria because um, he's someone who came from Greece and then worked really hard um, to get where he is and is a leader, team player, things like that. So I think he's someone who really loves football. So I think... If that were the case, Carl Loftus would be the pick. But I guess for this sake, um, the Texans also had a pro day visit, um, for Texas A and M, like the Texas A and M pro day, um. So they probably would have seen Green there and liked him there. So let's just go ahead and get Kenyon Green address the O line here in the in the first round. He still get really good value there. So I think that's pretty good. And Kenyon Green, he could play tackle if needed. Um, he does have positional versatility as well. So, all right. So at pick thirty-seven, um, let's see. Um, so you do have Brees Hall available. Um, if we wanted to go that route, or let's look at wide receivers. You have Sky Moore, George Pickens, Christian Watson, 
Um, a lot of good names here. So what do you guys think at 37? At 37, I feel like, um, go back to the oppositions real quick. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I feel like maybe the Kyer Elam. Oh, yeah, he's right there. Yeah. Maybe like a Kyer Elam. Um, I know we got, uh, Kyle Hamilton at number three, but why not get another yeah. piece of the secondary, get another lockdown cornerback? Or also maybe like a Pierre on Winfrey. I know that he's a very underrated name going through the draft right now. It's one thing, I guess, he's an interior deepest lineman where you have, I guess, Malik and Roy. But I guess you can't have an ever, you can't ever have enough interior deepest lineman or defense lineman in general. So maybe him, or if you want to get fun with it, maybe go Brees Hall. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know. And maybe get like a John Metz with this next second round pick, or maybe a George Pickens if he's still there. Yeah, I, I like Quay Walker in this pick too. Like, I feel like we haven't talked about him enough. As a second round pick that the Texans might take, we talked about a lot of other uh, linebackers, but we haven't really talked about Quay Walker's athletic. He could play our screen. He could just fit right in. So we could like maybe take that. You guys, like I'm pretty convinced on anyone. Kerry Elam is a pretty good pick here mm-hmm. too. Sky Moore, Brees Hall, but maybe we could just like give Quay Walker a shout out too. Yeah, I think Quay Walker is definitely worth considering. But since Kyrie did fall. I really like Kyrie as well, so I think I'd be inclined to go with him. Um, you, it's really good value at 37, so I'm just going to go with that. Just really solidify your secondary there. Um, so, yeah, I think that's how might be most reasonable. I don't know. We're getting some calls, Packers. I'm not sure if Nick Casero does move on from here. I don't want to compl- overcomplicate things, so I'm just going to do maybe one trade in this mock. Um, but you still have Brees Hall available at 52. I feel like that has to be – you also have Pickens available, so it would probably be between those two at that point. Um, what do you guys think? Uh, yeah, I really can't go on with either pick. I mean, it just kind of depends on what. Maybe you try to give um, Pep Hamilton his choice right here. You say, hey. You either have these two. Which one do you want? Do you want to help get a workhorse running back? Or do you want to get another wide receiver for Mills? And in Pep Hamilton's case, I feel like he would probably choose a Brees Hall. Brees Hall mm-hmm. could be a threat not only in the run game, but we've also seen him be a threat in the passing game. While George Pickens is just a strictly wide receiver. I mean, you really can't compare that. That's a wide receiver and running back. But Brees Hall, he would have a more all-around impact. The passing game, the run game. You could even put him in a run, uh, wide receiver, maybe in the slot a couple plays. Like if... You want to put him on the map, or maybe, um, maybe they still use Brett's Brett a lot next year. Like you can do a bunch of different things with Brees Hall, so I feel like Brees Hall would be the better overall pick. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that too. Pretty much, Brees Hall has to be your guy here. Like he's a workhorse running back. Pat Hamilton likes him. He, the off, like the front office career likes him, so he's definitely got to be the pick here in my opinion. Yeah, and I feel like for George Pickens, he does have some, like, behavioral issues. Like, he got ejected for throwing a punch, um, and he missed, like, half of the SEC championship against LSU um, in 2019. So, um, I think that was uh, an issue. So, I don't know if the Texans will steer, steer clear of that. Um, so, we'll, we'll see. But I think Brees Hall just makes a lot of sense here. Um, and him still being available at 52 is pretty good. So I think we'll go ahead and get him. He's arguably running back number one. Um, so I think that's pretty good value. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know why they make it so loud. Okay. All right. So, so, so far we got... That sound effect is so annoying when you're doing mocks because I'm doing like five or six a day at this point. <laughs> yeah. I'm just stuck in my head. Like I go to sleep and I hear that phone ring. <laughs> like, it's too much. <laughs> I know. That's crazy. Oh, man. Okay. Um, let's see. If it was me, I think I'll go to Messi. He's more of a all-around true slot receiver, and that's kind of what we mm-hmm, need for this mm-hmm. offense. Um, but there's also Chad Muma, very underrated linebacker right here from Wyoming. Uh, we've, all, we've seen that Nick Casario really likes his linebackers. Of course, Lovey Smith as well. We signed, like, nah, I don't even know the exact number, but we signed a lot last offseason. Um, so maybe Chad Muma. But if it was me, I think I would go John Messi, get that more true slot receiver. And we've seen that Nick Casario, he likes his slot receivers. We signed Danny Amendola from basically the streets. Um, 
we've gotten two. Who else? Not even, no. But I know that Nick Casario really, really values his um, slot wide receivers all the way from New England. Of course, yeah, Julian Edelman, um, Chad Hogan, I think his name is. I don't know. He's had a bunch of them. But I think John Metsy would be a very, very good fit for the slot position right here. Yeah, I like the Mechie pick, too. Maybe the Brian Asamoa pick. Did we take a linebacker? Or no, we have not. Like we spot? have not. Maybe we could consider Brian Asamoa, too. Like, we could find the balance between defense and offense. But both picks are, inter- like, normal to me. We already took a inside offensive line, so we don't really need Ken Art here. So, whichever one we go with, Mitch, uh, John Mechie or Brian Asamoa, I'm pretty good with both. So, it's your choice, pretty much. I also want to propose, should we try and acquire another pick in the third round? Do you say, like, we know Nick Casario, he moved up and back into the third round. Let's maybe create a scenario where he could try to trade up to the third round, maybe turning those fourth round picks and, like, a sixth round pick to a third round pick. I just want to explore those possibilities. So let's say like maybe like the Falcons per se, like they need they still need talent all across the board. Um, so let's see like what's the possibility there. Um, so if we were to trade both their forts for 74, that's unlikely. Wait, we have oh, we also got a fourth from Pittsburgh too. So we could just give them three fourths for a third, but even then I feel like they're getting a lot of value for that, honestly. Um, so maybe like two fourths and a sixth that might seem more viable. Let's see. So we can give the pick 107, pick 138 we got from Pittsburgh, and and pick 183 for pick 74. What do you guys think about that? Yeah, I feel like it's pretty good, especially when uh, Nick Casario really likes two of the guys there, maybe three of them. Um, I feel like he would definitely go John Messi with this first pick and then mm. hope. One of those linebackers, whether it's Chad Muma or the guy from Oklahoma, you have to hope one of them falls for that Falcons pick. But I feel like I would definitely do it. Um, Nick Casario, if he really, really likes the player we saw last offseason or last draft, that he would do the same thing. So I feel like it's pretty realistic, honestly. Yeah, and uh, so now we have three picks in the third round. That's pretty exciting. So let's go Mechie at 68. Um, and um, Muma does go at 70. But you still have Asamoa on the board. And I'm hoping Nick Benito lasts to pick 80 for Edge. Or there's also Cameron Thomas, Josh Bashaw. Um, So what do you think here at 74 then? Uh, Yeah, you probably have to go Brian Asamoa from Oklahoma. Um, Those Oklahoma linebackers, they were very underrated last year. Um, Obviously, Oklahoma didn't have the best year. But it is what it is. I feel like he has to go back. Yeah, so we do have a good balance. Yeah, and uh, Samoa fell, right? To the, I mean, uh, Nick Bonino fell to pick 80, right? I didn't see his name pop up. Yeah, yeah, he did, so... Yeah, so that's pretty much a pick right there. You go with Nick Bonino at 80. Yeah, I, I feel like we always land with Nick Bonino. <laughs> um, in a lot of our drafts, that might be the Drew effect or not, but I feel like overall we got a good balance. Um, of like offense, defense, like safety, inside line, cornerback, running back, wide receiver, linebacker. Um, and now we're taking an edge at 80. So yeah, that's going to be our three-round mock draft. Hopefully y'all enjoyed. Um, and yeah, so our final haul ends up being um, Kyle Hamilton, Kenyon Green, Kyrie Elam, Brees Hall, John Mechie, Brian Asamoa, and Nick Benito. I think that's a really, really good draft, especially because... Even despite us trying to troll, in a way, in quote quotes, um, by taking Kyle Hamilton because he could slide to 13. But I think we, we did two trades, and I think that's pretty um, likely, especially the Steelers could trade up to 13 to draft Willis. And then the Falcons, like, they need help all around the board, so they could definitely use those picks. So I think overall it turned out good. But, yeah, that's pretty much it for the podcast. Let us know your thoughts on the video and as always be sure to like subscribe and turn on post notifications thank you for watching peace